Hi, everybody. Welcome to the History of New Media Art. I'm your instructor, Jacqueline Gleisner. Today we will be crisscrossing the globe, landing first in Japan to take a look at the Gutai group, then we'll travel to Europe to view works by the Viennese actionists, and finally we'll be looking at performances associated with shifting ideas of gender. <clears throat> Before we get started, let's briefly summarize the last lecture. Through the work of Bruce Nauman and Vito Acconci, we saw intimate studio performances that were captured on film. Both Nauman and Acconci used video to record private actions inside their studios using the video camera as a stand-in for an audience. By contrast, named June Pike embraced mass media and new technology very early in his career. In fact, he is sometimes called the father of video art. Pike used video to record certain performances, such as his collaborations with Charlotte Mormon, seen here, but he also made standalone video art. Today we will be looking again at video as a complement to performance, as well as short films and video art. And we will start with the Gutai group. During the 1950s, Japan was recovering from World War II, and as a result, the idea of democracy and individualism was beginning to gain traction. In 1954, Yuro Yoshihara founded the Gatai Group, <clears throat> excuse me, the Gatai Art Association in the affluent town of Ashia near Osaka. The Gatai Manifesto was published two years later in the art journal. Gejutsu Shinko. Gitai means concreteness, and the group was influenced by the American painter Jackson Pollock, as well as art informal in Europe. As a whole, this small group of artists associated with the short-lived movement favored violent engagement with materials in their wildly energetic works. Here is one of Jackson Pollock's iconic all-over paintings, a network of lines, spills, splatters, and paint drips. Hans Hoffmann had employed similar techniques for applying paint, but Jackson Pollock transformed this technique to massive proportions, expanding the aesthetic and psychological power of large-scale abstract painting. This painting is a very early manifestation of this style for which he became famous. You can trace the movements of his arm across various paths on the canvas. He used sticks and dried out brushes to apply the paint onto the surface, dripping and splashing. The lines in the composition do not serve any sort of descriptive quality. They are thick and thin in places. Sometimes the paint pools, merging into a hazy, luminous hole that appears to loom over the picture plane rather than rest on its surface. He made these paintings by placing large pieces of canvas on the floor. Then he hovered over the canvas on the floor, earning the description of an action painter. Now let's review Art Informel, another influence for the Gatai group. French artist Jean Fautrier was the leading pioneer of the Art Informel movement in post-war Europe. The movement was founded by Michael Tapier, a French critic. L'informe in French means formless, so art informel roughly translates to formless art. Fautrier painted in a representational style in the 1920s and 30s, but after the war, he started working on a series of hostage paintings, built up masses of paint centralized on a background. His Naked Torso series was next. This painting, titled Nude from 1960, won Fautrier the grand prize at the Venice Biennale that year. Let's take a peek at how the ideas of Art Informel and Jackson Pollock may have found their way into the Gutai Manifesto. With our present awareness, the arts we have known up to now appear to us in general to be fakes, fitted out with a tremendous affectation. Let us take leave of these piles of counterfeit objects on the altars, in the palaces, in the salons, and the antique shops. These objects are in disguise, and their materials such as paint, pieces of cloth, metals, 
clay, or marble are loaded with false significance by human hand and by way of fraud, so that instead of just presenting their own material, they take on the appearance of something else. Under the cloak of an intellectual aim, the materials have been completely murdered and can no longer speak to us. Lock these corpses into their tombs. Gutai art does not change the material, but brings it to life. Gatai art does not falsify the material. In Gatai art, the human spirit and the material reach out their hands to each other, even though they are otherwise opposed to each other. Please watch the film linked on this page, which contains documentation of Japanese performance art. The film quality is low, so you'll need to exercise patience and remember when these recordings were made. As you watch, you may notice that this group focused on the medium of painting. They wanted to exploit its boundaries rather than exploring new media and technology. The next few slides are stills from performances by the Gatai group that demonstrate action and passion, two qualities that characterize this group. Here is At One Moment Opening Six Holes performed in Tokyo in 1955 by Saburo Murakami. This slide shows a large screen that was shot with arrows and spears. This image shows a man being laid on top of the painting surface. And finally, here we see a, a person making a painting by moving around in the mud. Through this small collection of images, you can see how traditional ideas associated with the medium of painting have been transgressed, echoing the charge led by Jackson Pollock and other action painters. Overall, the violent engagement with materials is very evident. Okay, buckle your seatbelts, students. We are about to dive into the explosive and offensive work of the Viennese actionist. Hermann Nitsch, Otto Mule, Kurt Krenn, and Valley Export comprise the Viennese actionist, the most radical group of post-war performers. They believe that destruction was the most immediate way to artistic expression, and they favored destruction as a way to show their independence from national socialism and the Nazi legacy. Many of the artists in this group started as painters, but they shared a disdain for modern artwork that was accepted into museums. As a result, they pushed their works into very violent territory. They were inspired by Freud's ideas of the unconscious as well as the Fluxus group. Otto Mule was one of the co-founders of the Viennese Actionists. He used his work as an artist to test the limits of what was seen as taboo. By using perverse and abject subjects, he escaped the confines of his society. He later also founded Friedrichskopf Commune, a commune where free love was practiced. In 1968, he was arrested after organizing and enacting an action Warnstellung Kunst and Revolution at the University of Vienna with other members of the group. He emigrated to Berlin. Mule's films were highly controversial, and he actually spent seven years in jail from 1991 to 1998 on charges of sexual crimes involving adolescents. After he got out of jail, he went to another commune in Portugal. This quote by Mule gives you a sense of his beliefs as an artist. He said, I can imagine nothing significant where nothing is sacrificed, destroyed, dismembered, burnt, pierced, tormented, harassed, tortured, massacred, stabbed, destroyed, or annihilated. This page contains one link at the top for several films made by the Viennese actionists. There are many videos to choose from, but I'd like you to sample a few of them. You may choose whichever videos you'd like, but please be warned that regardless of which video you select, you are likely to encounter nudity, sexual content, animal carcasses, fecal matter, and other offensive materials and ideas. Among the group, Valley Export had the broadest reach and most lasting reputation as an artist. 
While the others were heavily focused on the idea of destruction and the movement was short-lived, her works continued to be relevant. Waltraud Hollinger changed her name to Valley Export in all uppercase letters, named after a brand of cigarettes at age 28. Please watch her Touch and Tap Cinema linked on this page. Both this work as well as another video called Action Pants, Genital Panic, were performances that urged the public to engage with a real woman instead of with images on a screen. In these works, she illustrated her notion of, quote, expanded cinema, end quote, in which film is produced without celluloid. Rather, the artist's body activates the live content of watching. So we've seen that as a group, the Viennese actionists were inflammatory and incredibly controversial. They preferred expression through destruction, especially bodily material and material dissection. Their works were abject and perverse. Their films and performances were often sexual, violent, and or scatological in nature. And as a group, they were highly controversial. Members were arrested, there were allegations of illegal or immoral behavior, and they refused social mores. Now we are going to view how expanding ideas of gender impacted new media art. In the 1960s, women began to band together to affect change as they witnessed the progress of the civil rights movement in the United States. Title VII is the section of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that prohibited discrimination in employment on the basis of gender. The previous year, Betty Friedan published The Feminine Mystique. The book was a bestseller, and it challenged the position that women are happiest at homemakers and wives. In 1966, the National Organization for Women, now, was formed. Their goal was to pass Equal Rights Amendment, a constitutional amendment guaranteeing equal rights for women. First introduced in Congress in 1923, the ERA was passed in 1972, but failed to receive the 38 state ratifications necessary to become part of the Constitution. It has yet to be adopted. Let's read a bit of Betty Friedan's important text to set the scene. The problem lay buried, unspoken, for many years in the minds of American women. It was a strange stirring, a sense of dissatisfaction, a yearning that women suffered in the middle of the 20th century in the United States. Each suburban wife struggled with it alone, as she made the beds, shopped for groceries, matched slip cover material, ate peanut butter sandwiches with her children, chauffeured Cub Scouts and brownies, lay beside her husband at night. She was afraid to ask even of herself the silent question. Is this all? As we discussed in the last lecture, Carolee Scheman and Joan Jonas helped pave the way for a new group of gender performances. The German artist Ulrika Rosenbach was part of the feminist art and media performance scene, not just the general climate of outrage at unequal gender roles in the 1970s. Here are two stills from Rosenbach's performances, Reflection on the Birth of Venus by Our Own Hands from 1976. Another artist grappling with the idea of gender is the French artist known as Orlan. Orlan is best known for her work with plastic surgery, which began in the early to mid 1990s, but she has explored other media as well. Please watch the videos linked on this page to see some of Orlan's work. In her manifesto, Orlan wrote, Carnal art loves parody and the Baroque, the grotesque and the gro extreme. Carnal art opposes the conventions that exercise constraint on the human body and the work of art. Carnal art is anti-formalist and anti-conformist. We've covered quite a bit in this lecture.
The Gatai group's approach to art making was violent, energetic, and focused on materials, arrows tipped in paint, artists rolling in mud, and more. Similarly, the Viennese actionists were interested in using destruction as a pathway for creative expression. They also categorically abhorred norms, preferring free love, for example. And finally, performances, performance artists such as Ulrika Rosenbach and Orlan began to consider gender against the backdrop of the women's liberation movement. That's it for today. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you soon.